I learned in Korea that I would never again in my life abdicate to somebody else my right and my ability to decide who the enemy is. Please forgive me. Please, please forgive me. Please, please forgive me. I wasn't sure I could ever live in the country again. I got on the freight trains up in Everett, north of uh, Seattle, and kind of cruised the country for two years, making up songs, but I was drunk most of the time and forgot most of those. I'd heard that there was a house in Salt Lake City by the Roper Yards of the Denver Rio Grande and Western where there was a clothing barrel and free food. So I, I got off the train there. I was heading for Salt Lake anyway. I found that house, but right where they said it was, most of all, I found this, this wiry old man, 69 years old, tougher nails, heart of gold, fellow by the name of Ammon Hennessy. Anybody know that name, Ammon Hennessy? One of Dorothy Day's people, the Catholic workers, during the 30s, they started houses of hospitality all over the country. There are about 80 of them now. Damn, and Hennessy was one of those. He'd come west to start this house I'd found called the Joe Hill House of Hospitality. Damn, and Hennessy was a Catholic, anarchist, pacifist, draft dodger in two world wars, tax refuser, vegetarian, one-man revolution in America. I think that about covers it. It was pure hell. First thing he did was he said, after he got to know me, he said, you know you love the country. That you love it. You come in and out of town on these trains singing songs about different places and beautiful people. You know you love the country, you just can't stand the government, get it straight. He quoted Mark Twain to me, loyalty to the country always, loyalty to the government when it deserves it. Get it straight, get it straight. It was an essential distinction I had been neglecting. And then he had to reach out and, and grapple with the violence, but he did that with all the people around him. His Second World War vets, you know, on medical disabilities and all drunk up. The house was filled with violence, which Ammon, as a pacifist, dealt with every moment, every day of his life. He said, you've got to be a pacifist. I said, why? He said, it'll save your life. But my behavior was very violent then. I said, what is it? He said, well, I can't give you a book by Gandhi. You wouldn't understand it. I can't give you a list of rules that if you sign it, you're a pacifist. He said, uh, you look at it like booze. You know, alcoholism will kill somebody until they finally get the courage to sit in a circle of people like that and put their hand up in the air and say, Hi, my name's Utah, I'm an alcoholic. And then you can begin to deal with the behavior, see? You can and have the people uh, define it for you whose lives you've destroyed. He said it's uh, the same with, with violence, you know. An alcoholic, they could be dry for 20 years. They're never going to sit in that circle and put their hand up and say, Well, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. No, they're still going to put their hand up and say, Hi, my name's Utah, I'm an alcoholic. So it's the same with violence. You gotta be able to put your hand in the air and acknowledge your capacity for violence and then deal with the behavior and have the people whose lives you're best with define that behavior for you, you see. And it's not gonna go away. You're gonna be dealing with it every moment in every situation for the rest of your life. Well, I said, okay, I'll try that. And Hammond said, it's not enough. And I said, oh. that you were born a white man in mid-20th century industrial America. You came into the world armed to the teeth with an arsenal of weapons. The weapons of privilege, racial privilege, sexual privilege, economic privilege. You want to be a pacifist, it's not just giving up guns and knives and, and clubs and fists and angry words, but giving up the weapons of privilege and going into the world completely disarmed. Try that. That old man has been gone now 20 years and I'm still at it. But I figure if there's a worthwhile struggle in my own life, that, that's probably the one. Think about it. I'd always wanted to write a song for that old man. He never wanted one about him that way, but something mulched up out of his thought, his anarchist thought. Anarch anarchist in the best sense of the word. Oh, so many times he stood up in front of federal district judge Ritter, that old fart, 
and he'd be picked up for picketing illegally, and he never pled innocent or guilty, he pled anarchy. And Ritter'd say, what's an anarchist, Tennessee? And Ammon would say, why an anarchist is anybody who doesn't need a cop to tell him what to do. Kind of a fundamentalist anarchist, huh? And Ritter'd say, but Ammon, you broke the law, what about that? And Ammon would say, oh, judge, your damn laws, the good people don't need them, and the bad people don't obey them, so what use are they? I discovered watching him that anarchy is not a noun but an adjective. It describes the tension between moral autonomy and political authority, especially in the area of combinations, whether they're going to be voluntary or coercive. The most destructive coercive combinations are arrived at through force. Like Adam said, force is the weapon of the weak. Strong enough.